Hi everybody, welcome to La Lista, a Latinx writers podcast. I'm your host, Rube Mendive, and today we have a brand new guest here via Zoom. I like to start off every interview by having my guests introduce themselves. So your name and how you identify for the people at home. Hey everyone, my name is Johnny Alvarez. I am a queer Latinx writer and filmmaker. Where are you from? So like, what's the short story? What's the long story? Like, let's get some like family history. This is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, <laughs> the, short, the short version is that I'm from the Midwest. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, grew up very, very Midwestern, um, outside of the city and the suburbs, um, in a pretty conservative Catholic household. Um, that's definitely changed as me and my siblings have gotten older. But at the outset, it was a very like kind of traditional Midwestern Catholic situation. Um, which is very much, influ- for better or for worse, influential of who I am as a person and, and the type of stuff I kind of write. I like to say that I'm a recovering Catholic because um, I very much am no longer, <laughs> I don't know if I ever really did believe in God, but it. Uh, I tried really hard for a while. And then one day I just was kind of like, yeah, this isn't for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip along. The long version is like, I, I focus a lot on my dad's side which my mom gets kind of peeved about, but my dad is, was born in Cuba and left when he was two. And there's like a really rich history there that is really, really fascinating to me and I feel super connected to. And that's where my Latinx identity comes from. And my poor mom is very white and just kind of like a European mutt. So I tend to, I tend to ignore her side unintentionally just because it's kind of like, you know, everyone, <laughs> everyone has a European parent. Uh, it's not that exciting, but uh my dad's side is really fascinating because um, so my, my abuela and abuelo were uh, both very much like a part of Cuba in a kind of substantial way. Um, my grandfather was a medic in the army and a doctor in Cuba. And when they came over, he continued to practice medicine. And then my grandma, she was a lawyer and her father was actually Manuel Dorte Duque, who was a, also a lawyer and a professor um, and actually was uh, at one point a teacher of Fidel Castro's. Um, and he was a pretty well-known person in, in Cuba. He was one of the, I think it was like 40 people who helped sign the original Cuban, not the original, but uh, the pre-Castro Cuban constitution, I think in the 40s. Um, so that has always been really fascinating to me to know that like three generations down, there's like this like actual kind of historical figure in my family. So my grandparents, they decided about two years after my father was born, he's the youngest of, of three siblings. Um, and all the Castro shit was kind of starting to, to really ramp up. And it was actually two years before he officially came into power that they left Cuba on the, under the guise of going on vacation, which they were really lucky to like, kind of have a level of, you know, access and, and respectability that they didn't have to, you know, evacuate the country in a really harrowing way, which I, I think is really kind of a unique thing, especially, you know, the more I, this year in particular, I've been learning a lot about the Mariel boat lifts and all that. Um, so I've been really fortunate knowing that my grandparents, like, you know, had got to safely come to this country and they almost immediately settled in the Midwest, which I think is really hilarious because like so many Cubans settle in Miami and we do have a ton of family in Miami still, but my grandpa, I guess, had a friend who was like, I can get you work in Bellevue, Illinois. So come on down. And <laughs> I think they'd only seen snow once before in their entire life. And suddenly they're living in like the devil's pocket of of winter Uh, (laughs) so yeah my dad he followed in my my father's footsteps and became a doctor as well and uh he met my mom who uh she studied science and biology and was a lab technician for a while um so very very science oriented family i'm very much the um the odd sheep in that way they met while they were both working at the same hospital and the rest kind of just happened from there. You know, I'm from Chicago, so hey. So I've been to St. Louis a couple handful of times, you know, it's not that it's like a 6-hour drive I want to say, is that right? Yeah. And I always joke that like, you know, living in Chicago, being from Chicago, I always joke like St. Louis is like 6 blocks and like that's about it, like. <laughs> and cuz it, it just to be it felt like such a small city anytime I did. Um, yeah. So what can you tell us about like growing up in that like part of the Midwest? What was it like for you? It's really fascinating. When I look back on it, like I do feel like I really had a very like sheltered suburban kind of cliche middle America upbringing because really like 
when we're looking back, like we almost never went into the city. And like the more now that I know about St. Louis and the politics and the segregation and all the all the terrible shit going on in that city, it really um, colors my understanding of like what suburban what the suburban mindset really was and how prevalent it was and how my parents kind of fell into it. Even though like, you know, the suburb we're from Florissant is directly north of Ferguson and all of North County St. Louis um, has a very large African-American population. So it's not like, it wasn't like a super white upbringing necessarily, but it was still very suburban. And the understanding of the city was like, oh, we go for Cardinals games, but we get out and we don't like walk around. We don't really go to restaurants. Like, I really didn't have any sort of uh, city upbringing. And I actually went to college in Chicago. So that was like a huge, a huge shift for me, kind of both culturally and emotionally of like uh, understanding like where I wanted to live and what kind of life I wanted to live. So yeah, I don't know. It's like, I think we, I think in a lot of ways I had a really exceptional childhood because my parents are really good people and really loved us and they did their best by us. But at the same time, I think that like, the way that they were raised definitely trickled into our upbringing in ways that, you know, I think are common for a lot of people. And it's hard, it's hard to say, like, it was wrong per se, but it just wasn't right. Looking back, it was not like ideal for me as a queer person. (laughs) And going to Catholic school, I went to Catholic school from kindergarten through senior year of high school, and then immediately went to liberal arts college in Chicago. So that was like a very massive transition for me. Um, And I was, I was really constantly from like, honestly, like 12 years old, butting heads with this very like intense kind of indoctrinated culture that I was being exposed to. And I would honestly say that the religion was, the religious aspect of it was more nefarious at the school level versus the home level. I think my parents were kind of culturally Christian, but weren't like, you know, making us pray by the bedside with rosaries. Like they wanted us to be they wanted us to believe in God and they wanted us to be good people, but it wasn't like, you know, Carrie or anything like that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So I am always curious about people during that time. So like during the high school years, like 14 to 18, um, I like to frame it in like, who were you, who were you pretending to be? And like, how did other people see you during this time? Oh yeah. I was very much like an amorphous blob in high school. I think I, I adopted a lot of different identities because I was, I think I was weirdly ambitious about being popular, which is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I think that like, I think that my like survival instincts were kicking in and I knew that like the cards were stacked against me. I was like a chubby gay kid and like one of the few people of color in my, in my high school. And I felt like I really needed to prove myself. I also went to my freshman year, I went to an all boys Jesuit Catholic school, which was a nightmare. Um, and I transferred immediately as soon as I could to a co-ed Catholic school, which was much better. Um, it was a tiny, tiny school. It was like my second school. Um, I think my graduating class was like 83 people. So it was very, <laughs> it was very tiny. It was very incestuous. Um, and it started off really scary because I was like, there's a lot of pressure to like claim your identity here. You know, you can't just kind of like blend in with the crowd because it's like, there's not a lot of us. Um, and I knew at that point that like, I was, I was different from most people in the regard of like, I knew, I knew at that point that I wanted to be an artist or a creative of some stature. Um, so I think I really tried to lean into that and, and have that be my calling card, um, and try to try to kind of like, uh, live up to some sort of standard in that way. And being at a Catholic school that really had like zero, we had like an art appreciation class and that was it. Um, (laughs) <laughs> like we didn't even have like an actual painting class just so depressing but the more I I feel like I kind of pushed our grade to kind of like have more media outlets and I I was able to be the uh editor-in-chief of our newspaper I say in quotes because it was like a front and back piece of paper <laughs> like it was basically a newsletter but I like really I had this we had like a new teacher working the newspaper that year and she was really passionate we we're really on the same page about like making it more of like you know, I, I grew up loving Gilmore Girls. So I was just like, I want this to be like the Yale Daily. Like I want us to like really write hard hitting shit. And like, I always tried to write about politics, which everyone would like, I could hear people audibly groan when they would pick up the copies on Fridays in the lunchroom. And I'm like, I'm just trying to educate everyone. But like, I mean, I don't know if I really did. And at the same time, I, we also had a new class that was like a media production class and we got to make videos. And I was very much at, like, like jumping on that as like a form of expression. And we made like really stupid shit. Like we made a video parroting the asbestos leak that happened at my school. My 
<laughs> my senior year uh and we we the conceit was like a horror movie trailer uh where we all became zombies because we got asbestosis <laughs> my principal was not super thrilled about that but it was fun it was kind of like a like a parody a parody video thing and so yeah that's kind of a long-winded way of saying that I felt like I, I I pushed myself really hard to kind of excel in certain areas so that I couldn't really be feel invalidated in other ways I guess and so, you know, you mentioned that you went to Chicago for college. So can you sort of talk us through like the decision to like the school you went to, what you studied and like why Chicago? It's crazy to me to think that like I really only visited Chicago, I think once as a child, even though it's so close. And then the second time I visited it was to tour my school. Um, I had a friend who, you know, also wanted to, to kind of get out of where we were and wanted to, to go to art school. And she had actually found out about Columbia, which is where I went, Columbia College. She was like, let's go up for the weekend with my parents. And I I will never forget the first time driving into the city as like a conscious adult and like truly feeling butterflies in my stomach and being like, oh my God, like this, there's people here, there's things happening here. Like I, there was such a palpable energy, as I'm sure you know, especially in Chicago, that's so unique. And it was really like a super like kind of beautiful romantic kismet moment where I was like, this is where I need to be to do whatever it is that I want to do artistically. And Columbia was kind of the perfect stomping ground for that. Um, it's a messy school politically. Um, and I know it, like where it is right now is much different than, you know, even three years ago when I graduated. But um, I really did love my time there. I think the I studied film uh, production and write, screenwriting and television writing there. And I think that you know, some of the experiences I had both working on short films and in screenwriting classes and some of the teachers I had like completely changed my my outlook on myself and made me realize that I like could actually fucking do it. And I think that that's really rare for a lot of people. It's rare that you have someone actually like see something in you when you don't see it in yourself. And that was kind of really important to me and that I was really lucky to have that at Columbia. And like, you know, I'm always curious about people's like, writing and like filmmaking and artist journey so like can you so, sort of follow the breadcrumbs to like younger years to like then your decision to like major in it and study this and make this sort of like a career path yeah it's funny because I hear a lot of people I hear a lot of tv writers especially say like I didn't know this was a career until like I was in my 20s or like I didn't even know you could write for money and I, I knew that at a really young age but I do think I had kind of a mythology about like what it took to achieve it so it's like, I was like, oh, yeah, like, I just have to like, go to art school and like, figure it out. And I'll be I'll be a writer and it'll be great. And it was obviously never about the money for me. It was like, I, I, I was like an insanely voracious television watcher when I was a kid, and I still am. But like, I was like, head over heels for like Lost and Desperate Housewives and Prison Break. I was really into all those like, kind of juicy, soapy, serialized shows. And I remember just I remember like the first time I bought like a DVD or I rented the DVD box set of Lost from from Blockbuster, RIP. Uh, <laughs> and I remember watching like the first 10 episodes in one day, um, the original binge watch. And I remember seeing that the episode title for the first two episodes was pilot. And I had no idea what a pilot was. I didn't know what that term meant. So I thought it was just named after the pilot who gets eaten by the smoke monster in the, <laughs> in the first episode. I was like, okay, this is called pilot. But yeah, I remember, I don't know when I started to kind of like realize that like, screenwriting was a thing I wanted to do but I just knew I wanted to make movies I knew that like the way that they made me feel was so fucking undeniably like extraordinary and though it really lifted me from like what felt like a very kind of banal existence I, I remember feeling so super restless when I was a young teenager and just like my imagination was kind of my only salvation and I was I had always been I'd always loved reading as a kid I would get in trouble with my mom staying up till two in the morning when I was like 12 which you know, like I could have been doing something much worse, but she just wanted me to go to bed. <laughs> but yeah, it's funny because I remember like having some television show ideas when I was in high school and they were super terrible, obviously. But like, and I didn't know how to write. I didn't know how to screen write or I didn't even know like the software, anything like that. So I remember like my solve for that was I would make like fake Wikipedia pages for the shows that I, <laughs> the show ideas I had. Because like that, I, I still am like obsessed with Wikipedia and IMDb. It's like, I don't know why I spend so much time on those sites. Um, but I would like go through and pretend like my show had won all these Emmys already and like had these esteemed actors on it. And that was really fun for me. That was part of the imagination. It was like, not just what the show was, but like what pedigrees it would have. 
Yeah, no, no, it's so funny. I used to do like the same thing, but like I would do like outlines without even realizing they were outlines for like yeah. episodes, for, like series arc, like season arcs, and like yeah. just for like funsies when you're in high school, which is so weird. <laughs> yeah. I sometimes want to go back and find those old that old shit because I'm like maybe it wasn't such a terrible idea. <laughs> I think about that too. I think I threw mine away because I was I was going to college and I was like these are childish things. You have to be a grown up now. Yeah, exactly. So I you know I am curious about you know because I I grew up in Chicago, grew up in the city. When I went to college, I met a lot of like people not from Chicago moving to Chicago to like experience the big city. So right, I my perspective of like being in college in Chicago. It was so different from that perspective of like coming because for the Midwest, Chicago is like the big town. It's yeah. like you move there. So like, what, what was it like to move there and like your experience of Chicago as like a 20 something idiot who's like in college oh. and has no like real responsibilities? Oh, man. I mean, that could fill pages and pages and pages. And I'm, I'm really I am still trying to capture that entire experience in some sort of creative way, because it really in my mind plays out like a really romantic movie montage. I mean, that's not to say that, like, it wasn't fucking hard, like, especially my freshman year. I think I had rose colored glasses at first. In my first couple of months, I was just having a blast. So I was like, it was like independence to the max, you know, like, more so than going to some college campus in like the middle of Missouri, which is like mo- most of the people I grew up with, that was their experience. But like, I had this whole city at my behest. And like, I was meeting all these really weird, unusual people. I'd never really been around like young artists before. And you know that kind of quirky crowd and I have this like very specific memory of like my first two weeks at Columbia uh I met this girl who kind of just like you know was very much a leader of like we're gonna go to this place and this place and this place and you're just like okay I just want to have fun and we ended up at um I don't know if you've ever been to the Flatiron Gallery in Wicker Park it's right off the Damon Blue Line stop and they they would do first Fridays and uh, we went to one and ended up like hanging out with all the artists who were showing their pieces and there was wine and there's PBR. It was like very quintessential Chicago. We were like sitting in this loft and someone was like playing a, whatever that like scratch board instrument is. <laughs> uh, I just remember like reveling in that and feeling like so fucking cool. And I'm like, Oh, if everyone in high school could see me right now, I'm literally fucking Allen Ginsberg, whatever. But obviously like that romantic edge kind of changed. And I remember my second semester was when it kind of hit me that like living in a city is hard and you're exposed to a lot of, really complicated things. And I'm the kind of person who, for better or for worse, I'm very observant of my surroundings. And I remember just, especially like taking trans- public transportation around the city, you witness a lot of things that are kind of horrifying and kind of, you know, really devastating. And I took a lot of that in and it really started to kind of affect me in a deep way, um, but also made me feel really connected to Chicago. And I always say that Chicago is my second hometown, which I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but I, I still feel it deep in my blood, even though I've been in LA for, or I've been on the West Coast for three years now, but like, Chicago just is a very special place to me and it always will. I, I think the coming of age I experienced there is to me very monumental and I'll always take that with me and carry that with me. And I will never be able to <laughs> reconcile drinking culture here versus in LA yeah. versus Chicago. Like every time I go back to Chicago, my friends are like, yeah, I'll, I'll buy your, I'll buy your drink. It's like $3. And I'm like, Oh my God, like, taking yeah. shots left and right. It's so, it's so much easier to have fun in Chicago. Um, and yeah, it's like, a, it, they eat more, they drink more. Like, yes, my friends still eat meat in Chicago. None of them are vegetarians. <laughs> it's wild. Everyone in LA, it's you like, need, you need padding, you need the padding. It's so fucking cold. And you know, I think it is a lot of like a coming of age city for a lot of young people. And I, I always joke, like no one reps Chicago harder than the people who went there for college. Like, yes, yes. which is so funny to me. I know more people with Chicago tattoos that just what just just live there for four years than oh, I do. No. <laughs> for those who are not able to be psychic and I just showed my Chicago tattoo, my Logan Boy fuck Logan Square fuck boy tattoo, I call it. Yeah, and I feel like that's that also makes more up more of the residents of Chicago than we realize. A lot of people like yeah. move there and go there into adulthood, you know? Well yeah, I mean the Midwest is such a like I love the Midwest, but there's just not there's not as many hubs. Yeah, and like honestly like safe hubs to live mm-hmm. especially for people of color and queer people and I think that's why Chicago is so overrun with transplants because it's like where the hell else do we have to go where we can like actually live freely and express ourselves and you know it's not the west or east coast by far it's like Chicago really is this incredible mecca of I mean it ha- obviously has its issues but like you know it is a it is a place 
of safety in many ways, I feel. And, you know, I am curious about um, Columbia's film school because I've sort of mm. heard like mixed reviews. So like, what was your experience of it just for anyone that might be interested in it? Yeah, it's it's hard because Columbia really, they give you enough rope to hang yourself with in a way because they're really hands off about like, I mean, they tend, they just encourage you to, to pave your own way. And the thing about Columbia is like, you can go there, you can take classes and you can graduate and you can really not have gotten the experience you needed to be a filmmaker which is like kind of a complicated way of saying that like you really have to be invested and you really have to like you have to be a part of productions like that's the bottom line is like there's Columbia is a really good production school like they have incredible resources incredible com uh equipment and it's like you kind of just have to push yourself to be a part of those productions because they they had a really high production standard all, almost all the student films i worked on had like 50 to 60 people crews like it was not just like you know shooting in someone's garage you know one tripod two people like it was they were legit productions and they were you know beautifully shot not greatly written most of the time obviously <laughs> everyone's working on that um acting was like you know chicago has a really good kind of underground theater acting scene so there was a lot of like really good talent that just kind of hadn't really gotten a chance to, you know, they stayed in Chicago, which is like, it's hard to be an actor in Chicago, unfortunately. So I, I yeah, I really think it's like, if you didn't go into it knowing that like you were going to kick your own ass to push yourself forward and like do your own shit, um, it can be easily, it can really, you can really easily have like not a great experience, I think, because there's no one there to really hold your hand and there's no one really there to tell you the right thing to do, which like, you know, maybe is needed in, in certain film schools. But I think I needed that because I think that I, I had mentioned earlier that I had like a very mythological view of what filmmaking and writing was. And for me to suddenly be like, you know, given the keys to the kingdom, but like having to like <laughs> build the buildings myself was, a I think, really important because it's like I needed to figure out how hard it was and I needed to enjoy how hard it was or else I wasn't ever going to want to continue to do it for the rest of my life. So that was my experience, and I think. And so what did you do after college? Like, did you have a plan? Did things go according to plan? Uh, yeah, I did have a plan that I was really begrudging about, which was to move to L.A. Um, I had been dreading it for pretty much the entire time I was in college because, you know, there was a lot of conjecture about, like, you can stay in Chicago and you can have a career and be fine, which is true. Um, and many of my friends are doing incredibly well and, you know, thriving and working on really cool shit in Chicago. Um, but there was, there's also like a big camp of people who are like, if you want to do certain things, you have to leave. And that was like primarily writing, you know? Um, so I knew from, a, from early on that, like, it was kind of inevitable that I have to come to LA and I always had dreaded it. I, you know, just <laughs> all of the kind of cliche, terrible things about LA, I'd let really cloud my, my judgment. And so I moved here, I moved here to do our semester in LA program that Columbia does just like a six week intensive. Did not have a great experience with that, but I'd already committed to being in LA. I packed everything I'd ever owned into my 2009 light blue Prius and drove from St. Louis to LA. And I didn't really have any recourse to come back uh, to the Midwest. So I kind of had to make it work. And my first few months after I had officially graduated college were pretty fucking brutal. I kind of felt like I had to start over from scratch entirely. And that was really hard for me. I think I had a big ego coming out to LA because I'd done really well for myself at Columbia and in Chicago. And I felt really proud of the projects I'd created, the films that I'd shot. And I came to LA and that all kind of didn't amount to as much as I'd expected it to. And so I went through like a very, very angsty period of just like feeling like, you know, this isn't right for me. I'm not going to be able to make anything of myself here. If I am, it's going to like take the soul out of me. <laughs> but at, at the same time, I didn't like quit. I mean, like credit to my mother who fielded like probably a dozen sobbing phone calls while driving on the 405 in those first three months to the point that like I would call her after I was better and she'd be like, you're not going to cry, are you? And I'm like, mom, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's hard. I, I, I always say on the podcast, like the first two years are brutal. But if you can survive yeah. those first two years, you sort of like you sort of know you're here to stay. So okay. so, yeah, can you just describe those first two years for the listeners at home just so if they're about to do it, they're going through it. Like, what were those first two years like? They were really hard, but I think it was really 
again, it was kind of like the clipping of the wings thing where I really had to build myself up. And I think that looking at like where I'm at now, which like, you know, I'm still very much on the, you know, making my way up the mountain. But I do think that if I hadn't had that kind of like forced isolation and independence where I like had to kind of, I hate this phrase, but like truly like pull myself up, <laughs> pull myself up by the bootstraps. I don't think I would have the like confidence and ambition. I, w- I don't think I would have maintained that if I hadn't had to like push myself as hard as I had to, to kind of get my foot in the door, which I, I'm not even sure if I have yet, but I've at least gotten a piggy toe in the door, I think. Um, <laughs> it was hard. And like, the funny thing is, is I actually left for a year. Um, so I, I, I've been on the West coast for three years, but I've only been in LA for, I think I'm just now hitting like two years and a couple months. Um, cause I started working in film festivals, which was kind of my like salvation from production. Cause production was like really killing me. It's really fucking hard work and I have flat feet. So I just like, it was not tenable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so I started working in festivals and that actually took me on the road and I was working in Salt Lake City I was working in Seattle I was working in San Francisco and that I felt like I kind of had run away from LA in a way where I was like okay well I'm still working in film but I'm like I don't have to deal with the bullshit of LA where I just feel I feel so inconsequential and I feel like I'm drowning um but there was this little nagging voice in my head that was like Johnny you panicked like right when right when things were starting to ramp up for you and you were like getting work and you were doing things and you were feeling creative you ran because you were scared that it wasn't going to amount to anything um and so I came back to this place where I was like yeah I have to go back and just see if like there's I have to see if there's something for me there and I have to say I came back in February of this year right before quarantine happened and I have to say that like the last six or seven months of my life have been incredibly fortuitous and so it feels weirdly kind of um perfect that I did have my my sojourn away from LA while still getting to experience the beauty of the West Coast and the culture and, and kind of get more used to that because it is very jarring for Midwesterners, I think, um, like to see people be so kind of carefree and liberal <laughs> uh, for the most part, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I, uh, I don't think mine is like a very traditional trajectory, but I do. I, ha- I remember having a, this commercial director who knew my dad, weirdly, who gave me some advice early on and was like, get out of of LA as much as possible your first couple of years, because it can be all consuming. And if you force yourself to stay there thinking that like, if I just put my nose to the grindstone for this first year, I'll make it like you're gonna burn out really quickly. So it's like, yeah, get out of LA. I don't know, go to fucking the Salton Sea and stare at like dead birds and just like, (laughs) like get away from LA because it is such a headspace more than just a place and it can be really overwhelming. And, you know, you mentioned that you sort of got into, like, the film festival circuit and, like, and I'm very curious about that because I oh. feel like it's very, like, I don't know in 2020 how how crucial it, it, it is yeah. as opposed to how it used to be. So sort of can you, like, just talk about your experience with working, doing that, like, behind the scenes and, like, the good, the bad, the ugly, like, what, what can you say about that time? Yeah, I'm so, so glad I did it. At the time, it felt like, it really did feel like grunt work, unfortunately, but in retrospect, I'm like, I'm super fortunate because like, I think a lot of people take for granted how fucking hard it is to put on a film festival. I think people like understand how hard production is and how hard it is to make films, but like people putting on productions, especially I worked two winters at Sundance. I'm like, everyone at Sundance works their fucking ass off to put that festival on. It is really brutal. It's a really intense undertaking. And it was, I think it was really important to me to see that like, there's a lot that goes into the, the, there's a lot of business that happens at festivals. And it's, it's funny that you bring up that like now, nowadays, you know, with festivals going digital, I do wonder how much kind of uh, relevance they're going to continue to have because like seeing, seeing how much politics and how much business was happening at Sundance alone in the course of two weeks was insane. And it's like, I do think that, that they specifically put their money where their mouth is as far as getting these independent projects off the ground. Cause it's like, where else are, where else are these huge producers and EPs and, you know, big name people gonna get to watch these kooky little indies about people, you know, fucking on the beach and being weird, you know, like that's, it's a really special platform, but it's, there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot writing on it. And what was really valuable about that experience in particular is I got to work directly with the filmmakers as their, as their kind of, you know, guide through the festival. And it was really fascinating for me to kind of like bench my own ego of like, well, I'm, I'm a filmmaker too. Like, 
you have to leave that at the door or else you're just going to make a fool of yourself and like probably get fired. <laughs> so it was nice for me to kind of pretend to be somebody else and just be a fly on the wall and like meet these honestly like directors that I'd idled for years and just be like, hello, I'm a person who's going to take you from point A to point B, but also like, I'm going to like seriously watch how you're going through this crazy experience of like having your film premiere at Sundance and walking the press line and, you know, talking to all these fucking crazy Robert Redford and all these crazy people. And it was super valuable to get to see that from a, from a kind of safe, protected place and just know that like, it's really vulnerable and it's really scary to show your film in that, that big of a platform. And you have to really be like the champion of your project. And yeah, I could go on and on, but I'm really, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful for all the people I've met to working festivals. Like those are, those people are some of the hardest working people I've ever met and they love film. And a lot of them don't have egos about it, which is so refreshing. And I think that really speaks to like the intrepidness of working in festivals. It's like a lot of people do, you know, move around the country a lot to do it and I think that it's all about the love of the art and it has really nothing to do with you know clout chasing or climbing the ladder or anything like that and it was really amazing to be in be in that realm um and you know I'm curious about what your parents like what are they thinking throughout this whole journey you know what are, <laughs> what's your sense of their thoughts about what you're up to oh man they're uh, they're fucking rock stars honestly I my sisters give mad at me because I I do I give my parents a lot of shit because of their politics, which I think is deserved. And I will continue to, I will continue to bring their feet to the fire over that because it's like the least I can do, but they have been so unbelievably supportive of me from the start. And it's my mom will admit that like, I think I was 14 when I first told her, like, I think I want to make movies. Like, I think I want to do this. And I, and she told me after the fact that like for those four years of me going through high school, she would like pray constantly that I would change my mind but she kept it to herself which is a credit to her like she really didn't want me to do it but she didn't also want to like <laughs> ruin my dreams and by the time I was 18 I hadn't given it up and wanted to I was like I'm gonna apply to film school she was like all right this is what you're gonna do and we believe in you so it's time to go uh and it's interesting that that kind of as beautiful as that was and you know the funny thing too is that my dad also at one point uh wanted to be I think I don't know if he ever like put a word to it but he was like making short films with my uncle when they were kids and like I remember he wanted to go to a film camp and his mom didn't end up letting him go so and then he just kind of got thrust into like medicine because that's that's the family business so I've always felt that like maybe my dad is kind of living living his dreams through me which is like sad but also kind of beautiful and I think that I don't think he regrets anything but I think that's where he comes from as far as like being super supportive because he didn't have as many choices as I did um and that was that was always their ethos was like we'd rather our kids take a risk and fail than be unhappy and I think that that's really admirable for parents of that generation for a lot of Latinx people like claiming that identity like everything that comes with it especially in your personhood is like can be a complicated journey so I am curious for what what that journey has been like for you I talked to so many Latinx writers each one of them are their thing is like, I don't know if I'm being Latinx enough. Ugh. Okay, that's so refreshing to hear. I constantly feel insecure about claiming the Latinx identity because I am, you know, it's really taken me this year to kind of just like stop fucking around and being like, I am a, a white Latinx person, right? Like I <laughs> I would always get into fights with my mom because she's a biologist and she's like, well, Johnny, Latino is not a race. And I'm like, but mom, it doesn't matter because racism happens to Latinx people. And yeah, I mean, like it's complicated because there's biology and then there's like the social realities of being Latinx and like they don't really match up in my mind. And it, it's always funny to like come down to like, especially now with voting happening, like having to kind of classify yourself always feels so, I always wish there was like a comment section <laughs> so I could be like, well, I am saying that I'm white, but... <laughs> Because it's complicated. Like, I I don't think I would be who I am or pursuing what I want to do or care about the things that I care about if I wasn't Latinx, you know? Like, I think I came from a place where assuming a kind of white identity and, like, using that as a shield and using that as a field force is really easy. I, I hate to say this, but, like, I, I, especially with my father, I can see the survival instinct of that. And I think that there are, like, a lot of white Latinx people who do take salvation in that knowing that like the cards are stacked against them and 
you know, it fucking sucks that that has to be the case. And that certainly isn't to forgive racist Latinx people who are especially Cubans running wild. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it's just like, there is this pressure cooker situation when you are an immigrant in this country and you kind of toe this line of two different identities, like, what are you going to pick? Um, and I honestly am just really grateful that I did get to really lean into and can still lean into my Latinx identity more than my white identity, because I think it just, it's just, it's a really, it is a really like kind of deep rooted thing for me. And I think the insecurity comes from the fact that like, you know, as a lot of us do have these kind of very disparate levels of privilege in this country. And, you know, I don't have an accent. I can, you know, pass as any old white guy if I want to, if I'm not wearing my tank top that says putaria on it. <laughs> Like, you know, I can, I can kind of glide through life easily, but that's not interesting to me. That's not valuable to me. And I don't want to, I don't want to have an easier life than I already have. I want to have a challenging life and I want to, I want to own up to like who I am. And that's like, you know, a Cubano fag, like that's who I am. <laughs> and I love that about myself because it, it, I see the world differently because of it, but it's been tricky, you know, like I, I think a lot, I've had a lot of internal and external fights, especially within my family, because I think that, and I don't hold this against them necessarily, but like my sisters in particular, I don't think kind of claim their Latinx identity as strongly as I do. And I'm not sure why that is, you know, like, you know, they're both dating white men. My sister has two white kids. They live in very, you know, white parts of the world. And that's just kind of what works for them. And I'm happy for them that they've, you know, figured out what works for them, but it that is something that is like so horrifying to me. I don't know. I just, I, yeah. I think like coming to the, coming to LA in particular has been really eye opening for me of like what I, what, what was, um, what I lost growing up in a, in an area that wasn't very Latinx, you know, like the culture we kind of had within our own household was very, it was a, it was a very like, it was a hodgepodge of things and it never felt super, looking back, I don't feel like I grew up in a Latinx household. Um, you know, we had like my dad's aunt Carmen come over and she would feed me an entire sheet of flan. And that was like the most Cuban I felt. But like, I was more focused on the sugar than the culture, obviously. So as an adult now, I feel like I'm constantly pushing myself to, you know, get outside of my comfort zone and explore my culture more because I do feel like, you know, I had a very specifically kind of, I had a very specific type of like immigrant household experience that I think a lot of people are familiar with that kind of like forced assimilation that my dad and his family was very much affected by. And I do think that that unfortunately um, divorces away a lot of beautiful things about the Latinx identity in the name of like assuming this American identity, which is like fine, but it's not everything, you know? Yeah. And, and that American identity is based in whiteness. So yeah. if you're trying to assimilate, then you're trying to like be white, you know, exactly. that's like, that's like the, the golden ticket, the like goal we all should be, um, aiming for as immigrants you know that's what that's what it's taught to us yeah and people are people are get so sensitive about that comparison like americanness to whiteness it's like just take a look at what you're saying and thinking and feeling like <laughs> like being proud to be an american is a really bizarre concept to me i don't know i'm not, I, don't, I don't know if i should get into all that yeah I, you know i read this other way i was like this country's a scam they scam my family we came <laughs> here and they scammed us like it's a fucking scam it is such a scam <laughs> So sort of how you got on my radar was I saw your short film and I, that's what I was like, oh, this is, this is really interesting. This is someone that's like, I could see everything that was like trying to be like conveyed through this like small film about this guy. So can you just like sort of like first tell us the premise um, and sort of the journey to like making it? Uh, yeah, so I made I made a short film in 2018 called Victory Boulevard, and I made the film with Outfest um, through their pro through their program Outset, which is their young queer filmmakers program. Um, it's an incredibly wonderful program that I know is is going under some really important changes right now to to address kind of the state of the world. But when I did the program, it was it was I met some of my closest friends in LA and some of the most amazing some of the most amazing people and they all helped me make my film, which was really beautiful and special. And it was a film of where I really very much was kind of returning to a childhood sensibility. You know, it's about a, a 14 year old kid kind of living in a very isolated apartment building in Van Nuys um, in the, in the Valley and how his attraction to his older neighbor kind of brings him out of his shell. 
Um, and it, it's funny because Victory Boulevard is very different than what I typically write. I typically write things that are very dark and horrifying and depressing. And Victory Boulevard was the first time I ever made something that was like super cute and sweet and like vulnerable. And <laughs> uh, and it's funny that that's kind of become in a way my calling card because I, I'm a very cynical person, unfortunately, and very ne negative a lot of the time. Um, but making making that film was really special for me because I knew I knew going into it I wanted to make a film that was queer but had very low stakes and that there was never a fear of anyone being hurt you know emotionally or physically. It was really important to me to make a queer film that had a really simple, pleasant ending, you know, because I think that a lot of queer stories in real life are not these like great melodramatic tragedies, and obviously you know that's a lucky experience because there are a lot of horrifying tragic queer stories that are as important but i think i think as queer people we want to see victories horrible pun but like yeah like we want to see positive stories because it's not all sorrow like we have joy in our lives and we have simple quiet moments that aren't political or forcing us to take a stand for anything you know we have very we can have very banal existences as well <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, what really struck me about the film, it was, like, Latinx, it's queer. It also has to do with, like, body image and, like, mm. the, and just, like, small victories. And yeah, and I think that just from watching it, I could, t I could see, like, the vulnerable parts of you that you were like, let me just put this on film for you all. <laughs> I really did capture it all. It's like, I know we, we got to show the belly. Like, we got to have the belly because I had the belly and I was obsessed with Butterfinger and Dr. Pepper and, I think that those kind of you, those childhood tendencies really carry through with you to adulthood. And like, I still really cling to sweets as my like vice. Um, I think it's really interesting the ways in like what we use to kind of protect and shield ourselves as kids doesn't ever really go away. With my guests, I like to like hear about, you know, like what, what are, what are some of the themes that you see come up in your writing? What are like the stories that are attractive to you? What are, what do you feel like is always calling you in your storytelling? The stuff that I like to write, I think I really like to to push things to a really difficult place. I think that like the stuff that I watch and read that really speaks to me are things that kind of make me incredibly uncomfortable or make me cringe or make me honestly horrified because I think that that engages my brain in a way that other things don't. And so I'm really attracted to, and honestly, it's also like my sensibilities and the way that I feel and my, you know, kind of difficulties in life all feel very dark. <laughs> And I think that that's, that really bleeds into my writing. And I'm a huge fan of horror. And especially with this wave of like horror films that are about something, which like, you know, I think horror films have always employed a certain kind of factor of like, this is a cheap thrill, or at least that's how people have seen them. And to me now, like seeing, seeing what filmmakers are doing now feels really simpatico with like what I want to do, where, you know, horror makes you think about yourself and about humanity and about the real life horrors. If I had to sum up like my sensibility, I would say it's like real life horror, but I also am really interested in religion because that to me is a horror, f horror film. Catholicism is a horror film. And I wrote a horror film about Catholicism because <laughs> it's just, I don't know, it's fascinating to me. I think that like movies and TV, we have, the we have the opportunity to push the limits of like what can happen in a world. And I think there's a, a, a important place for like cutesy, romantic comedies and I love comedy don't get me wrong but like I think the stuff that I want to make I want to be really hard to digest because I think life is really hard to digest and I'm not a fan of sugarcoating it or creating an escape from it because I think sometimes you have to look directly at the most horrible things happening and figure out what they mean or why they exist and kind of move on with your life and you know you recently had some like good news come out um so if you want to talk about that share what's coming up on your journey yeah, so I had a very exciting opportunity this year. I was selected to be in the Sundance Episodic Lab, the first ever, first ever all digital one, which was a little bit of a bummer because normally you get flown out to the the Sundance Resort in Provo, Utah, which is a very beautiful place. Um, but it was amazing. It was so amazing. I'm, you know, I'm not just saying that. Like, easily the most incredible thing that's happened to my career thus far. Um, it's pretty much changed everything for me and the people who run it are so committed to helping us all. The other writers who were selected were so supportive and fun and hilarious and engaging and 
even though we were all stuck in our, our own bedrooms talking to each other through, you know, our CIA capture machines. <laughs> it still was fun. It was really fun. And we got to meet some really unbelievable television writers uh, who talked to us in a really kind of no bullshit way, which is super, super helpful um, to kind of have people meet you where you're at. And um, even though they have these kind of incredible intimidating careers, just talk to you like human beings. And I, I honestly think that like the digital aspect of this maybe kind of set us up for more candid conversations, you know, because we are sitting in our homes and, you know, we're all kind of brought down to this level during the pandemic where we're all human and, you know, just like suffering. <laughs> but yeah, that experience, which we just, ra we're still kind of in the process of doing it. They're, this year, they're um, stringing it out over a couple of months, but like the main intensive, like two weekends of the program were earlier this month. And it, it changed my life not to be uh, melodramatic, but yeah, it was pretty amazing. I never really asked this, especially during Corona times, but like, cause, cause I feel like it's a very cheesy question, but it's like, what's next for you? Like, what are you looking yeah. forward to? Uh, uh, you know, like what's next for me is like, I'm in a really fortunate situation now for the first kind of five or six months of, of quarantine. I was really, I mean, obviously everyone's struggling, but from a career standpoint, I was really hustling and it felt really difficult to keep up this, like, keep up this like energy to be like, a productive money making person uh it just felt so arbitrary to what was really happening and like you know i've always <laughs> been a pretty anti-capitalist person but like more, more when you're stuck at home all day but still have to work you really start to realize how ridiculous work can be and how it is this this prison of the mind whatever whatever not going to get into my socialist feel but that was hard for me and i have gotten to a place now where I'm lucky enough because of because of the amazing things that have happened the last couple of weeks. Um, I have the chance to kind of focus on myself as a person. Ah, boring, but it's true. And it, it, it to me, it feels like the most intense and scary project yet because I I'm really bad about taking care of my mental health, <laughs> and it's been it's been a a thing that has needed to be like worked on for a while and. I now have the chance to work on myself and also work on my projects in a kind of like isolated vacuum, which is really helpful. Really, it's a huge, I've never gotten the chance to not have to be like freaking out about work and money and like also finding time to write. So that's, that's what's next for me on a kind of granular, granular scale. But I don't know, I feel, I'm glad we're doing this interview before Tuesday because what's next for me could be a mental hospital. Who knows? But uh, right now I'm feeling obstinately opt optimistic about where my life will take me but it's it's hard to it's hard to lean into that when you know that like the world we're living in is really unbearable <laughs> i'm trying i'm trying to do what i can with what i have and do things for others with what i have which is hard because i don't consider myself to be like a person for others only in only in so much that this is getting really personal only in so much that i still i feel like i still haven't secured my you know oxygen mask properly in order to put someone else's on so but it is it, it's important to me to one day be that person and i'm i'm trying my best to you know accumulate as much uh resources as i can to give them back because i i know that like as a person who has grown up the way that i grew up especially as a latinx person with as much privilege as i have it it is entirely my duty to give back to our community and i don't know i'm not like saint francis of assisi but i know that i can help people uh, at some point, and I want to because this industry is not interested in, they're not doing a very good job of helping Latinx people, full stop. Yeah, and you know, it sort of leads me to my next question is, I like to know who are the writers that you admire. So these could be heroes, these could be peers. Um, I also call it like people you creep on Instagram who don't know who you are, but you are a fan. <laughs> so who are some of those people for you? It's funny because like my de my idea of what makes a writer has changed so much and especially with social media, I feel like there are writers who are like, who never sit down and type a word, if that makes sense. I think there are a lot of people creating stories on the internet that are really fascinating to me. Some are really repulsive, but some are really fascinating. But like, to keep it really like straightforward, the, there are two people who I, in the last couple of years, I think have really like, especially for Latinx people, have taken humongous strokes that will benefit all of us. And those people are Stephen Canals and, and Tanya Siracho. Um, especially with Tanya creating, I think it was, the, is the first all Latinx writers room. When I first found out about that, I was so like overwhelmed with joy. Cause I'm like, 
I, I, I can't imagine anything that would be more fun than that, you know, and anything that would be more beautiful and fruitful and Vita is such an incredible demonstration of what happens when Latinx people get to come together and just like <laughs> shoot the shit and have fun and be creative and tell our stories. And um, obviously with Pose, with Stephen Canals, that the kind of groundbreaking achievements in the trans community that that's brought about. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot, I think there are a lot of people too who are doing things on a smaller scale or who who aren't as, I, I am really, I, I tend to admire authors more than screenwriters for some reason. Cause I think that like writing TV and movies is really hard, but I think that writing books is so fucking unbelievably hard. I've started and stopped so many book ideas. I, I could probably like pad the walls of a courtroom with them, but the, there's a writer named Pro- Brontes Purnell who is from Oakland who um, really changed my life as far as like how a queer person can talk about their sexuality. Um, I, I cannot recommend enough his book, Johnny, Would You Love Me If My Dick Were Bigger? It is a very quick read. It's very delicious and easy, easy to digest. And it is to me like the most absurdly, grotesquely beautiful queer manuscript that exists. It is so like unabashedly horny <laughs> and I'm, I'm the kind of person who like, se- like sex is not like the most important thing in my life necessarily, but I think it is a huge thing that is important in my writing and sex and sexuality. I just think I know, kind of always come up for me because I think that it's a really emotional experience. And it's really fun to mine humanity in that way. And I think something Brontes does with his writing is like just show how stupid sex is <laughs> or like how we're all really just animalistic and, and he doesn't write it in a like cute kind of writerly way like he will literally say like I got poop on my dick like that's what's so beautiful about his writing and I I, I esteem to be as like inappropriate and horny as as he is one day so where can people follow you on social media you can follow me on Instagram at j-m-i-g-a-l-v you can see some ridiculous photos of me and some cute photos of the places I've been so I like to have my guests title the episode of the podcast So there is a prompt. The prompt is a blank Latinx writer. In the blank, you can put as many words as you want. You can mix them all around. Just what feels true to like you, your writing, this conversation. Um, I also use it as a sort of like community building tool Uh so that when people see the title, they can be like, that's like me. I should listen to this. I should follow this person. I should be friends with this person. So (laughs) what do you got? Uh, I was thinking a lot about this this morning. I was really kind of freaking out about doing the perfectly summarizing me. I think what I came to was um, a a lovably deranged Latinx writer. And with that, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. This was such a fun conversation. It's always great to meet a fellow Latinx Midwesterner. Hey, thank you so much, Ruben. This was, I'm, I was really looking forward to this for a while. So thank you for having me. And to the listeners, thank you for t- tuning in. You can follow us at La Lisa Podcast on Instagram and Twitter. And we'll be back next week with a brand new writer. Bye. Bye. Bye.